Few engines in history can claim to have shown as much promise as the Bristol Centaurus. Developed as Bristol's hyper engine that would power the next class of 2,000 plus horsepower fighters, this 18 cylinder sleeve valve engine packed over 3,000 horsepower into a 3,270 cubic inch package. And likely it could have packed much, much more. It would later go on to attain legendary status in the air racing scene. And yet, despite all of this, the Centaurus is also an engine strangely shrouded in mystery. If you've ever tried doing some casual digging around on the internet to learn more about the Centaurus, you're likely left with more questions than answers. Why wasn't this beast of an engine ever fit into a significant number of aircraft until after World War II? Why were only 2,800 of them ever built? Why is it such a struggle to find detailed information on the engine? Where are the books? And you wouldn't be alone. I had these very same questions, but I'm happy to say that after a substantial amount of effort, I think I've finally gathered enough information to make today's video, in which we'll be unraveling the mysteries behind the Centaurus. But first, as always, let's hear its sound. Now, before we get started with today's video, I just wanted to take a second to shout out today's sponsor, Masterworks. Between supply chain constraints, energy supply issues, and staffing issues, the airline industry has taken a beating in the last two years, and the pandemic exposed many industries as less profitable than we thought. As a result, many people lost billions of dollars combined. Now, with traditional investments still getting wrecked by the current state of the economy, it's possible we haven't even seen the worst of it. For context, the stock market has lost $13 trillion in less than a year. And now, the strategies our parents relied on look a lot shakier. Historically, physical assets such as real estate and gold are known as safe havens during economic meltdowns, but high mortgage rates have sent the housing market into a spiral. And gold may be historically stable, but most investors might need more to recoup the losses inflation are taking away. So if the experts are predicting more carnage, where are they taking some of their money? The answer might surprise you. It's fine art. Thanks to a fintech unicorn called Masterworks, you can now invest in museum-grade contemporary art for a fraction of the cost. This isn't NFTs, it's not cryptocurrency, this is the art that people like Jeff Bezos spend millions on, because he knows it can be a powerful investment. Banks like Barclays and Goldman Sachs agree, saying, assets like art can function as a risk-reducing element in a portfolio because of its low correlation to equities or bonds, while also being a real asset. It's no wonder a recent city report found high net worth investors are on average buying double the art they did pre-pandemic at even higher prices. So if you're looking to diversify with an asset whose prices are historically less volatile and could help protect you from inflation, then investing in contemporary art may be an attractive option for you. In their last three exits, Masterworks has delivered net returns of 17.8%, 21.5%, and 33.1% to their investors. And they're just getting started. Over 550,000 people have signed up so far, but my subscribers can get priority access at the link in the description. So if you're at all interested in investing in blue chip art for the very first time, give Masterworks a try and purchase shares of great masterpieces from Picasso, Banksy, Warhol, and more at masterworks.art slash flight dojo. Our story begins with one Sir Roy Fedden, chief engineer at Bristol Engine Company. Before his time at Bristol, around the time of World War I, Fedden worked for a smaller company known as Brazil Straker. This company, amongst other things, built Rolls-Royce engines under license. As part of this arrangement, Fedden was forbidden from creating his own liquid-cooled engines, but this constraint only served to focus his ingenuity elsewhere, as he would go on to create some of the most ingenious air-cooled radials ever conceived. Brazil Straker would go on to be purchased and renamed the Cosmos Engineering Company. Not long after this acquisition, Cosmos launched its flagship engine, the Jupiter, and while the engine would not be enough to save the company from filing for bankruptcy only two years later, it did show early signs of promise, featuring a four-valve head, while other twin-row radials rarely saw more than two valve heads due to the complexity of the drive system for the extra valves. Our story could have ended with that bankruptcy, and with it, our hero fading into obscurity. 
But as fate would have it, Sir Royd Fedden's genius was recognized by the British government, who in turn convinced Bristol to purchase Cosmos Engineering Company and its assets. Throughout the 1920s, the company continued to build on past successes, launching the Jupiter II, the Mercury, and the Pegasus engines, all with the distinguishing characteristic of featuring more than two poppet valves per cylinder. However, in an interesting turn of events, Fedden became convinced that poppet valve designs had reached their limits due to the detonation challenges inherent in poppet valve systems. Rather than pursuing a program of incremental improvement with existing technology, as competitor Rolls-Royce would do, Fedden made the fateful decision to attempt to circumvent the issue entirely by pursuing development in sleeve valve technology. Now is a good time to take a step back to gain some context on sleeve valves. We went over a lot of this in more detail in my Napier Sabre videos, which I'd encourage you to watch as well if you haven't. But here's the condensed version. In 1909, Peter Burt of the Argyll Company in Scotland and James McCollum in Canada both independently arrived at a single sleeve valve design and eventually came to an agreement calling the design the Burt McCollum. Fast forward to the 1920s, English engineer Sir Harry Ricardo had picked up the development of the single sleeve from the Burt McCollum design and began effectively touting it as the holy grail for the future of piston-driven power. As proof of this assertion, Ricardo built two identical engines save for their valve designs to test whether the poppet or the sleeve valve was superior. When all was said and done, the sleeve valve had higher specific power, lower specific fuel consumption, and lower specific weight than its poppet valve rival. Furthermore, the sleeve valve could also use a higher compression ratio due to the lack of red-hot exhaust valves. Given all of this, we can get a sense of what tempted Sir Roy Fedden to abandon poppet valves in favor of sleeve valves. Of course, we also have the benefit of knowing what lay in Fedden's immediate future, that a second world war was imminent and the substantial advances in poppet valve design would soon render the inherent advantages of sleeve valves largely irrelevant. And we can hardly blame Fedden for this lack of clairvoyance, but nonetheless, at this critical point in time, just a few years before the outbreak of World War II, Fedden embarked on a journey to perfect the sleeve valve design, a journey that would turn out to be long and filled with unforeseen challenges. Now to be fair to Fedden, he did achieve some eventual success. His first commercial sleeve valve engine was the Perseus, a nine-cylinder air-cooled radial. Released at a time when poppet valve technology was still lagging behind, the advantages of the sleeve valve design were immediately apparent. While the Perseus was just about the same size as the Mercury, it made more power. Additionally, the development of the Perseus led to two important lessons for future sleeve valve technology. Firstly, it was found that maximizing the surface area of the cylinder heads via baffling and cooling fins was necessary to address the additional heat buildup caused by increased power density. And secondly, was just how critical sleeve valve material was to engine success. Following up on the Perseus, the Hercules was a 14-cylinder, two-row, air-cooled radial. It would become the most significant engine Bristol manufactured throughout World War II. By the end of the war, Bristol would build nearly 65,000 Hercules engines. However, despite the success of the Hercules, the ever-increasing rate of technological advancement led to a constant demand for more power. As such, work soon began on the project that would eventually become the Centaurus. An Air Ministry development contract was officially obtained for the Centaurus in February of 1938. Previous Bristol engines had featured a 5 and 3 quarter inch bore and a 6 and a half inch stroke. To meet increased power demands, the Centaurus departed from this pattern, increasing the stroke to 7 inches. This, combined with the increase from 14 to 18 cylinders, resulted in a displacement of 3,270 cubic inches. On face value, this project seemed, theoretically, like a fairly straightforward upscaling of the Hercules, but reality would prove otherwise. One of the initial problems was the aforementioned sleeve material. Enormous effort was spent on squeezing the potential out of the sleeve valves, and critical to this task was finding an alloy of sufficient strength for the sleeves. In the end, the steel company Firth Brown was commissioned to conduct 1,100 metallurgical trials for the cost of about $2 million. In the end, they landed on a high-expansion alloy steel of nickel, manganese, chromium, centrifugally cast, and then nitrited for hardness. But this effort cost Fedden and Bristol years. Even after this problem had been resolved, a second one quickly arose, that of wartime urgency. The years of delay in solving the sleeve valve problem meant that by the time the Battle of Britain was on the horizon, Bristol had only just begun the actual development cycle of attempting to extract power from the Centaurus engine. The British government, faced with an imminent threat, began consolidating their support for various engines. Engines like the Napier Sabre and the Bristol Centaurus fell victim to this consolidation and began receiving reduced support in favor of the more complete Merlin project. If that weren't enough, the Centaurus project hit another roadblock. Now, it was problems with its forced induction. 
In an effort to reduce engine length, the supercharger impeller was designed without curved inducer vanes. Furthermore, the limitations on the diameter of the supercharger casing meant that volute size was limited by the need to connect a pipe to each cylinder. Both of these factors in combination effectively neutered the supercharger, and the Centaurus performance at altitude suffered greatly. All of this culminated in the Hawker Typhoon performance prediction study, which by that time had completely taken over the Tornado project. As we can see, the Typhoon with the Sabre 4 was dramatically faster than the Spitfire 9. However, what's interesting for our purposes is the projected performance of the Typhoon with the Centaurus. As we can see, the Centaurus gave a superior performance at altitudes below 20,000 feet. However, at altitude, the Napier Sabre, which was also interestingly being criticized for its poor supercharging, was the superior engine. In the same year, the project would take another heavy blow. When the Bristol Board of Directors citing Sir Roy Fedden's combative attitude and general stubbornness as an issue decided to let him go from the company. While his attitude was certainly not as cooperative as other chief engineers, his departure from the project certainly contributed to further delays. A year later, with Fedden removed, Bristol would still be struggling to improve their supercharger design. To combat this issue, they did an extensive study of the supercharger from the BMW 801. Unfortunately, as the supercharger on the engine was the least well-developed part of it, they learned very little. As a result, Bristol was still struggling to see the Centaurus reliably boosted above 8.5 pounds. For reference, at the same time, the Merlin was now happily running along with 25 pounds of boost. To add insult to injury, not only was the supercharger design an issue, but once again, the sleeve valve problem reared its ugly head. As the boost was increased, the sleeves proved to be the weak point. With increased power, the sleeves would warp, and the resulting out of roundness would cause catastrophic engine failure. As I alluded to earlier, all of these problems stem from Fedden's fateful decision to pursue sleeve valve technology over improving poppet valve technology on the presumption that there was no future for poppet valves, a presumption we know, with the benefit of hindsight, to be incorrect. It is interesting to consider how things might have turned out had he instead chosen to stick with the poppet valve design. Interestingly enough, that's a course of events that almost happened. Before the Perseus, an engine called the Hydra was designed with a twin octagon layout and four valve heads. However, due to the short stroke of the design, they attempted to build the engine without a center bearing, which proved to be a mistake. When it became obvious that the new Hydra engine would need to be redesigned with a center crankshaft bearing, Fedden instead opted to begin work on developing the sleeve valve, Hercules. And he did so knowing that the path ahead was difficult. In his own words, quote, I was urged on by a ferocity of effort and the conviction that a good idea must eventually prevail. This standpoint, I believe, was inspired by those who said the single sleeve held out so much promise, but was a Jonah, and always defeated those that wooed it." Unquote. Perhaps it was equal parts scientific conviction and personal hubris that led him to overcommit to the sleeve valve design, but I digress. By December of 1944, after more development and testing by Bristol Engine Company, the Centaurus 7 could be reliably boosted to 15 pounds. At this power rating, the engine generated 3,000 horsepower on 115 octane fuel with water injection. Disappointingly, by that time, it was too late for the Centaurus to make a difference in the war. Only 2,800 engines would be produced in total. That being said, the engine would still see flight after the war, particularly in the Hawker Sea Fury. But before we dive into the engine post-war, let's first talk about its actual design. As we said from the outset, the Centaurus was designed to be in the 2000 horsepower class. As such, it was initially designed as an upscaled version of the Hercules, before it was decided that, for increased displacement, the stroke would be increased to 7 inches from 6.5. The resulting total displacement was, again, 3,270 cubic inches, or 53.6 liters. In terms of layout, the engine was a twin-row design, with two sets of nine cylinders, 18 in total. In contrast to the Hercules, which drove all the sleeves from the front, with the rear cylinder sleeve drives utilizing extension shafts running between the front cylinders, the Centaurus instead had its rear sleeves driven from the rear, which avoided the necessity of threading the drive between the front cylinders. The Centaurus used a three-piece cylinder block held together with long studs, and each end section contained nine gear-driven lay shafts, each of which drove one of the rotating cylinder sleeves. The sleeves had an interesting pattern of motion, moving elliptically due to the way they were mounted to the drive shaft, which was via a ball-type joint. Later versions of the Centaurus replaced the carburetor with direct fuel injection, which boosted the power to 3,220 horsepower, but these were never fitted into aircraft. Interestingly, a projected larger capacity version of the Centaurus was drawn up by Fedden called the Bristol Orion. 
This two-row, 18-cylinder sleeve valve engine had its displacement increased to 4,142 cubic inches, or 67.9 liters, which made it nearly as large as the monstrous Pratt & Whitney R4360. In terms of the applications for the Centaurus, it was eventually fitted into 16 aircraft after World War II. The most notable application of the engine was its use in the Hawker Fury, as well as its naval sibling, the Sea Fury. Right now, if you take a trip over to Greg's Airplanes and Automobiles channel, he has an excellent super prop series in which he gets into the nitty gritty concerning all things Sea Fury. It's definitely worth a watch if you'd like to know more about this incredible aircraft. That being said, to put it briefly, both the Fury and the Sea Fury were wildly successful aircraft considering they were piston-driven aircraft in the landscape quickly becoming dominated by turbine-powered aircraft. So much so that had they been brought into service before the end of World War II, they would have no doubt achieved legendary status. So what can be said of the mighty Bristol Centaurus? Well, I'm inclined to agree with Callum Douglas's viewpoint on the matter. In his book, The Secret Horsepower Race, he points out, like so many amazing what-if piston engines of the World War II era, that the issue was timing. Had the Centaurus been developed a few years earlier and its supercharger system been thoroughly developed to the point in which its incredible performance could be maintained at altitude, a war-defining aircraft would have resulted. By focusing their efforts on developing their poppet valve line of engines into what would have undoubtedly become a poppet valve version of the Centaurus, Bristol wouldn't have had to waste a decade learning how to produce reliable sleeve valves, and as such, a reliable engine would have been achieved sooner, and the problem of redesigning the engine to withstand more boost pressure could have been tackled and completed in time to make a difference in the war. One can only imagine what would have happened if American turbocharging technology was mixed with a reliable Centaurus, ready for production in the late 1930s. A Fury-like aircraft early in the war would have likely shortened the war considerably.